Good news and I have better news. So the good news is that I just checked outside and they have the cocktails all set up. So we're in good shape. The better news is I am not going to take very long, so don't, don't worry. I, I promised you this morning that I was going to show you a little case, so a little case-based teaching here. So I told you when we were at the Bellagio meeting, Emmanuel Mikasa raised his hand halfway through the meeting and said, hey, I've just been in contact with my government and they would like to actually be the pilot country to implement your indicators, your recommendations, et cetera. So we put together a, a team several weeks ago, and I, I locked them in a room and didn't let them out. And, and this is what they came up with, and it's really impressive. Literally within a couple weeks, uh, they acquired this information that fits to the indicators that I talked about this morning. So let's take a look at need, first of all, and surgical volume. So they looked at uh, the, the met need and the, and the unmet need in, in Zambia, and you can see here uh, that the total minimum need would be about 6,100 cases. There are about 1,600 cases per 100,000 in Zambia. That, that's a deficit of 4,500, all right? And then this is really some fascinating work that, that Martha worked on. She uh, got a list of all the district level and higher cases in Zambia, and then used Google Maps to figure out uh, by road travel what would two hours look like. So, so all these colored areas are two hours away from a first level facility. And then used some software from NASA to overlay the population density in that country so that we could figure out what percentage of the population is within two hours of a hospital that theoretically could, could perform the bellwether procedures. Now I say theoretically because we haven't gone to all those facilities. This is kind of like one of our indicators light, all right? Uh, but what it shows is 75% of the Zambian population lives within two hours driving distance of a first level hospital that theoretically can, can provide those bellwether procedures. Now, I think it gains more interest when you look at this across countries. So if you're a minister of health, and I'm sorry that didn't show up so well, that's Pakistan, and that's about 84%, the numbers are a little small, you're going to make very different decisions about how you have to scale up for surgery than when you're at the left side of the graph here and you're at 31%. So if you're Pakistan or Zambia, your road system and your hospital distribution is not too bad. All right? If you're over here, you have a problem with roads or where your hospitals are or both. Now we looked at the SAO provider density, 1.1 1 .1 per 100,000. Again. If you're a minister of health and you have your facilities where they are in Zambia, that's not bad, but this is an issue. So they have a workforce issue. Their facilities seemingly, as long as they do provide the bellwether procedures, not horrible, but workforce, that's an issue. All right, and we talked about this earlier today, the, the theoretical target of 20 to 40. Let's look at financial risk protection. So. This is what catastrophic ex expense would look like in the rural setting there. This is what it would look like in the urban setting. If you live in the rural setting in Zambia, almost anything you do surgically is going to be catastrophic. All right? If you live in an urban setting, if you need a cesarean delivery, that's tremendously catastrophic. All right? it, gives you, it gives you a sense for, uh, at the country level, what, what our indicators might mean. 56% chance of facing catastrophic expense if surgery is needed, all right? Or 137 new cases, 137,000 new cases. 94% chance of incurring an impoverishing expense by a single C-section. And I will tell you those numbers are for direct expenses, all right? If you add indirect, the numbers go up closer to 98, 99%. This is the graph you saw in our report, but this is for Zambia. So instead of 12 trillion, it's 10 billion, all right? So this is something that their Minister of Finance, you know, I'd like to have a little chat with them about $10 billion that could potentially be saved. I guess I would flip it around and say, what would you be willing to invest to potentially save $10 billion in GDP? Close to 2%, which is what Gavin talked about. So Zambia holds with, with the modeling that we had done before in terms of the, the drag on GDP that surgery might represent. And then lastly, we laid it out in terms of our indicators one through six. So 75% within two hours, 
an SAO density of 1.1, surgical volume of 1,600, and remember we talked about a theoretical uh, goal of maybe 5,000, but based on the Zambian uh, burden of disease, it looks like they need a little bit more than 5,000. This is something that we can't get right now from available data, so when we visit Zambia, we're going to figure out how do we get this kind of data. Is it available? If not, what, what's the next step? And then I showed you this impoverishing and catastrophic expenditure data, which is just direct expense. So this is just a very quick kind of interesting example of what can be done fairly rapidly. And, and even uh, I thought it was fascinating to see the different countries in terms of the distances from first level facilities. So I think this will be very powerful when ministers of health can look at this and say, you know, where, where is my country compared to my neighbor? Uh, where do I fit in terms of infrastructure, manpower, work, workforce rather? Um, perioperative mortality rates, et cetera. So with that, we call this a launch for a reason, and we've talked about that today. It's not, uh, it's not the end. We're not celebrating the, the completion of the project. Uh, we, have, we have a long way to go, and there's been a lot of talk about accompaniment. And I would say that we need to expand our concept of accompaniment. And so traditionally, it's been our accompaniment with our low resource partners, but you heard talk about transprofessional education. And I think we need to think more about transprofessional, trans specialty accompaniment, working with different specialties, working with different international organizations. We're going to have to accompany a lot of different people, a lot of different organizations, and we're going to have to work together. We're going to have to work together with all the different global health movements, as was just said in the last panel. A whole lot of thank yous, 111 countries, and I, uh, I only speak English, so I can't, uh, I can't say many of these, and, and uh, as, as Sarah says, I speak really good, really bad Spanish. Uh, but uh, I, I'd like to thank a few people in English. First, the Lancet and Lancet Global Health. Wouldn't have happened without them. I really appreciate that they gave us this opportunity, gave our community this opportunity. Uh, this, is, this is really uh, potentially a game changer. I'd also like to thank all of our funders and our commissioners. So we had our initial commissioners for the first three meetings, and then we had our, our Bellagio Rockefeller commissioners, and they, they both played a really critical uh, role in developing the report. Uh, then some of the, the funders and, and entities that helped with this particular launch, so Harvard Med School, the Children's Hospital, and the Kletchian Foundation. And I want to thank our social media community. So as I said before, this has really been beneficial. It's allowed us to communicate with the community, but it's also allowed the community to communicate with us. So some of the research that was done, we, we were able to uh, you know, get information through social media. G4 Alliance, we talked about. I think this, they will be very important in the future in terms of ad advocating for surgery. And as I mentioned before, DCP3, really happy to have been involved with them. and, and uh, they really taught, taught us a lot about how to, how, to, uh, how to act with a project like this and how to collaborate in a, in a project like this. And then, of course, WHO and USAID and World Bank. Uh, each organization was wonderful. We visited them several times. There were a number of people from each organization that met with us several times, and, and actually many of them were at the Bellagio meeting. So uh, really, really appreciate their help. And uh, just... For any information you need, actually all of the, uh, all of the information that you picked up outside is, is uh, available electronically on, on our website and it's also free on the Lancet site. So with that, I, I won't keep you from the cocktails any longer. Thank you very much for coming today.